Well, did you get any precipitation on Friday? A little bit. I hesitate to call it rain. Uh, it wasn't quite rain, but it was certainly appreciated. You know, I was a little confused at first by all that stuff that got up there and blocked the sun out. It had been so long since I'd seen any of that. But my grass is definitely singing a song this morning, you know. Uh, it was getting pretty parched. Well, we've been uh, all the way through the book of Matthew, the gospel of Matthew. We got to the very end. Ma uh, Matthew gives Jesus the last word in his gospel, rightfully so. We've spent a couple of weeks looking at these words called the Great Commission, but there's so much here that I'd like to turn our attention back to it one more time. In Matthew 28, verse 19, Jesus said, go make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So let's stop this morning right here and talk a little bit about baptizing, baptism. We're called Baptists. Uh, why is that? Uh, why do we baptize people? Well, the short answer to that question is right here in this verse. The reason that we baptize people is because Jesus commanded us to do so. Now, we could expand that just a little bit and say Jesus was baptized, and we want to be like him, and Jesus commanded us to baptize, and we want to, uh, we want to obey him. Uh, and for a lot of people, that's enough. But uh, there's more to baptism. There are reasons, and I want to turn back just a few pages in the book of Matthew you know, this whole baptism issue occurred before Jesus came with a fella called John. John the Baptist. It's been a while since we looked at him. But John made a very important statement in his ministry that helps us understand baptism, Christian baptism. When Jesus said baptizing them, he didn't say just go baptize them. He said baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. In other words, he's saying that I want you to baptize them not just any way, but I want, you to, I want it to be a Christian baptism, a baptism that reflects the biblical Christian view of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So what is that? Turn back to Matthew chapter 3 and verse 11 with me for just a moment. And let's look at this verse again. Remember John. John was living out in the wilderness. He was kind of a strange sort compared to everybody else who lived in town anyway. John wore garments made out of camel hair, and he had a leather belt. He ate locusts and wild honey, and he preached out by the Jordan. Now, you would think that somebody with a preaching ministry out by the Jordan who eats bugs and wears camel hair would be doomed. But his ministry was incredibly powerful. The Bible tells us that people from Jerusalem, Judea, and all of the region around the Jordan came out to listen to him preach. What's really astounding about John is that he never did a single miracle. Some people might say, well, people just went to listen to Jesus because they wanted to see him do a miracle, and that was probably the case for some. But with John, that was certainly not the case because John never did any miracles at all. With John, it all boiled down to this one thing. It was his preaching. He had a powerful word from God, and it was compelling to people. People went out and they listened to it. And John preached a very, very simple message. His message was one of repentance. It was a message of turning away from disobedience to God, sin against God, and turning toward a life that is fruitful for God. And so all of these people were coming out and they were being baptized by John in the Jordan as he preached out there. And in uh, chapter 3, verse 11, take a look at it. Here's what John said. He said, I baptize you with water for repentance. But one is coming after me who is mightier than I am, whose sandals I'm not even worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Of course, we know that the he John is speaking about was Jesus. They didn't know it at the time, but soon they would see Jesus come and be baptized, and Jesus' ministry would take off, John's would wane. So John's ministry was preparatory for Jesus. John was preparing people for Jesus, and he did that with a baptism of repentance. 
a baptism of repentance. Now, this whole idea of people going down into the Jordan River and being dipped in the water might have seemed a little bit strange to folks. It was a bit different. It hadn't been done like that before, uh, but it wasn't completely new. The Jewish listeners who heard John preach were used to the idea of ritual cleansings. They were used to the idea of using water to make things uh, spiritually or ceremonially clean through cleaning them with water, their hands, their bodies, the cups and saucers that they used, and the things that were used in the worship of God in the temple. So what John was doing wasn't a complete departure, but it was different. The idea of everyone going down into the Jordan and dipping their bodies there as an re act of repentance, that was different. Now when Jesus came and he picked up where John left off, and he began his ministry, he did not push John aside. Jesus took what John was doing, he kept it, and he built on it. In fact, Jesus' very first words when he preached sounded just like John. He said, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. And so he, he was affirming John's ministry. In fact, Jesus was baptized by John in the Jordan. And so he affirmed what John was doing. He took it and he built on it. He was the one that was coming after John who was greater, the one who would bring the, uh, the culmination of this baptism. So Jesus' uh, baptism, Christian baptism, picks up, if you will, and it takes what John established along with us. So let's write a couple of things down. Here's the first question this morning is, why do we baptize? Now remember the short answer was, we baptize because we want to obey Jesus. But we're looking for a little bit longer answer here. We want to go deeper. We don't just want to say, well, we baptize because we're commanded. We want to be able to say, what is the meaning? What is the deeper meaning of baptism? I want to give you two things here that come from, surprisingly, from what John said. Uh, because John was a prophet, and John understood who Jesus was. And so he's giving us information here uh, that is good even today. First of all, we baptize as a sign of turning from disobedience to God or disobedience against God. Baptism is a sign of turning away from disobedience to God. Now, that's kind of as far as John went. John got everybody ready for Jesus. You know, Jesus is coming and we got to get ready to turn away from sin uh, because we can't follow Jesus if we've embraced sin, if we're following the ways of the world, uh, if we're not ready to obey God because Jesus... He didn't go into all of this, but Jesus is God. He's the Son of God, uh, and we've got to obey Him. But this was the first step, and today it's still the first step. The first step of spiritual enlightenment, the first step of spiritual life, new life, is always to give up the old life. This is a struggle that we all have. We had it when we got saved. The struggle that we had when we got saved was to give up the old life. Once we realized that the old life had doomed us, the life of sin, and that it had to be set aside and we had to adopt a new life, a life of righteousness and following Jesus uh, and walking in the Spirit, we, we went through a struggle. Most of us, now maybe your conversion was easy. Not everybody's is the same. But a lot of people struggle. It's called being under the conviction of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes in and makes all of this stuff really uh, real and alive to us. And we see the choices that are before us. And that first choice is to say no to the, to the life of the world, uh, the life of the devil, the life of the flesh, all of that stuff that at that time we were used to. Now, once we're saved, it doesn't mean all of that immediately goes away. We still struggle with it. And so the idea of repentance is still important as we walk in the Spirit. But now we have a new power uh, to, to face that challenge. Look back at uh, chapter 3, verse 11. He said, I baptize you with water. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. With the Holy Spirit and fire. Now, Christians still use water, uh, and the early church still used water for baptism, but it, it became a symbol of something more than just repentance. It became a symbol of the Holy Spirit of God coming into a life and purifying it the way fire purifies metal. Now let's remember that the Holy Spirit in the Bible is God's invisible, personal, powerful presence in the life of God's people. 
God's present in the world today in an invisible way. He is a spirit, but it is still God. It is still his presence. It's still all of his power. It's still all of his love. It's still all of his truth. And when we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, all of that moves into our life through the presence of God's Holy Spirit. All of his power, all of his presence, all of his truth. We have, we have access now to all of those things. Now, we may struggle making access, taking access to it. We have to learn to walk in the Spirit and to be filled with the Spirit, not to quench the Spirit, uh, not to grieve the Spirit, that as we learn, we realize that there is a new presence and a new power in our life. It is literally the power of God in our life. Now, we have that power not because we're good folks or, or because we've impressed God or because we've earned it from God. That's what the baptism is all about. When we're baptized, we are giving ourselves to God, and God gives himself to us by an act of grace. So why does he say the Holy Spirit and fire? He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. There are some groups today who are proponents of two different baptisms, or even more. That there's a baptism uh, when you get saved, and then there's a baptism later on uh, by the Holy Spirit, but there, there is no uh, evidence of that in John's teaching or Jesus' teaching. Uh, and the early church uh, baptized people in water when they had received Jesus, and they received the Holy Spirit right then and there. In fact, when we read later in Ephesians, as uh, the Holy Spirit was uh, giving the leaders of the church time to reflect and understand what he was doing and, and write these truths to the churches. When Paul wrote to uh, uh, the uh, believers in Ephesus, he said this. He said, there is one Lord, there is one faith, and there is one baptism. One. Not two, not three, not five, but one. When we receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, we are baptized as a sign of something that has already happened, that God's Spirit has come into our life as a fire, a fire of power and a fire of purity. So let's write down this next sentence. Why do we baptize? As a sign of joining with God through Jesus, through faith in Jesus. The sentence could get a lot longer, but we'll keep it short. As a sign of joining with God through Jesus, the Holy Spirit is also called the Spirit of Christ. And so when you have the Holy Spirit in your life, you not only have God's Spirit, you have Jesus' Spirit. Because everything that's God's is Jesus's, and everything that's Jesus's is God's. Because God is, remember, we baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You have one, you have all three. Now, in the next verse, verse 12 and following, actually it's in verse 13, we see the story of Jesus being baptized by John. You remember, Jesus came when everyone else was being baptized, and he came down into the Jordan, walked into the Jordan with John, and first John said, I need to be baptized by you. And you're asking me to baptize you? And Jesus said, let it be done now so that we can fulfill all righteousness. And John baptized him. When Jesus came up out of the water, he saw the Holy Spirit looking something like a dove coming down and resting on him. And he heard the voice of God audibly say, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Now, the point here that I want to make is that Jesus went down into the Jordan and John baptized him, dunked him into the water. This is another one of the questions uh, about baptism. Not only why do we do it, but how do we do it? Because there are a lot of different ideas about how to baptize, all right? But the word that's used in the New Testament, baptizo, means quite simply to dip. Jesus was dipped in the Jordan. Some people say today that you can be baptized by being sprinkled or have water poured on you. Here's the thing. In the New Testament language, there was a perfectly good word for sprinkled, rantizo. There was a perfectly good word for pour, ekkeo. And rantizo and ekkeo are never used for baptism. Baptism is always baptizo, bapto. It is dip. Why is that so important? Why make an issue of that? Who cares if some people get sprinkled or poured on? Why is it so important to be dipped? Well, the dipping is important because of what uh, Paul wrote in Romans chapter 6. 
And these are words that we use very often when we baptize. You know these words. We are buried with him through baptism and raised to walk a new life. Now, so the baptism, Christian baptism, is a symbol, it's a picture of what? Of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. But the person who's being baptized obviously isn't Jesus. It's John or Mary or Sue. And so John or Mary or Sue, the one being baptized, is now joining with Jesus in his death, burial, and resurrection. It's a symbol that the old life of John, Mary, or Sue, which was a life of sin and was doomed and on its way to hell, is in God's eyes dead, buried, and gone. And John, Mary, or Sue now has a new life in Christ that is on its way to heaven to spend eternity with God. And that's the life that God recognizes in the believer. And so, yes, it is important to baptize people in a way that reflects these truths accurately. The death, burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Here's your next sentence. How do we baptize? By immersion to symbolize the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. This is on the back of your back of your bulletin if i forgot to say that most of you know this i always do on the back of the bulletin the fill-in outline you think it's for you but it's really for me because if i didn't have that back in full in, uh, that fill in whatever <laughs> if i didn't have that oh you'd be dragging me off the platform you're done you see the beauty of the fill-in outline is i know when i'm done you know all right so by immersion dipping Immerse by immersion to symbolize the death and resurrection of Jesus. Now that word symbolize, notice in the first two sentences I use the word uh, signify. Signify, symbolize. There are some people who teach that the baptism itself is what saves a person. That the baptismal waters have regenerative power. That the, that the baptismal waters literally wash away your sins. Now the, the Bible doesn't teach that. The Bible teaches that baptism is a sign, it's a symbol. And this is clear from Romans chapter 6, the passage that I just talked to you about. Obviously, when the person goes down into the water and we say the words, buried with him in baptism, nobody's literally being buried. That's already happened. Jesus was buried and he was raised again. This is a symbol, a sign to make us think about the burial of Jesus and to think about the fact that this person too, has been buried in a sense because their old life is dead. So the waters of baptism do not save anyone. That would be an insult to the blood of Jesus Christ that he shed on the cross. It's his blood that saves us from sin. It's his blood that cleanses us from sin. And to say that some water that we put in from Camden Water is going to save you is an insult to Jesus or any city. Nothing against Camden Water. It's the blood of Jesus. The water is a sign, it's a symbol, it's a reminder of what God has done to us. Not only that, it is a public profession. When you got baptized, you were letting everyone know who was there, that you identified with Jesus. When Jesus got baptized in the Jordan, he was letting everyone know that he identified with the ministry of John the Baptist. He was affirming that ministry, picking it up uh, and carrying it on. There was a time when the Western world and Europe was dominated by the Roman Catholic Church. The Roman Catholic Church, though, had gotten so corrupt that they wouldn't even let their people read the Bible. They discouraged it. Because if you were to read the Bible, you would have realized that the church was so far off the mark that it would have been a problem. But something happened. People began to read the Bible. They began to go back to the Hebrew Old Testament. They began to go back to the Greek New Testament. They began to read what was in the Bible and they realized that the church had gotten way off course. That the church was selling indulgences and implying that you could buy your salvation by giving money to the church. And the Bible said that Jesus died on the cross for our sins and by God's grace and faith in Jesus we're saved. Not by giving money to the church or doing anything else. Good deeds, whatever it might be. And so these people who were reading the Bible, they stood up and they said, you're wrong. 
That's not what the Bible says, and a great struggle ensued. And the people who did this, the reformers, people like Martin Luther, they're called reformers because they wanted to reform the church. They wanted the church to get its act together and do the right thing, but the church refused. And so they didn't, they didn't start out to do this, but what they ended up doing was starting new churches. They were called Protestant churches. And in these Protestant churches, they began to, once again to teach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Salvation by the grace of God through simple faith in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And people started to get saved. But there was a division among the Reformers because, you know, that was so much change. That was major societal and cultural change. We don't even have time to talk about the amount of change that that brought. And so you can only take so much change at a time. And, and most of the Reformers, they reached a certain point and they stopped and they said, we can't change anymore. This is too much. And so they kept some of the errors of the Roman Catholic Church and they propagated those errors. And one of them was infant baptism. One of them was the idea that the state is supposed to coerce people into believing what the church says they should believe. That the state and the church work together to force people to join the church and believe the way that the church says. And there were some crazy people in Europe who said, this isn't enough, this is wrong. We need to, we need to make a clean break from all of these errors. We, we, Jesus never taught us to use the power uh, of the state to, in, to intimidate people into believing, to force people into believing, to take money away from people as taxes to support the church. Can you imagine the local government taking taxes out of your check to support a church that you don't believe in or attend? And they said, no, that's wrong. That's wrong. And, and they said, we shouldn't be baptizing these infants in pretending that somehow or another that they're already Christians, that they're already part of the church, that they're already part of this complex, this state church complex. It's wrong. That's where the corruption came from in the first place. That's why the gospel got set aside and the church is so corrupt because it's gotten involved in all of these other things. And so they began baptizing adults. They began baptizing people after they professed their faith in Jesus Christ. Now, they were called re-baptizers because everybody at this point had been baptized as an infant. And so as far as the culture and the society was concerned, these wackos out here are re-baptizing people. Hey, we already baptized them. And so they were called Anabaptists, re-baptizers, because they were baptizing people who had already been baptized and they were persecuted. In England, the Baptists were persecuted by the Anglican Church because they were re-baptizing people that the Anglicans had already baptized as infants, and they tried to explain to them, but, but you don't understand. People are supposed to be baptized after they receive Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And they tried to come up with a theological description for why you would baptize an infant. They said, well, it's the same thing as circumcision in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, they circumcised a baby when it was born, but circumcision just makes the point for believer's baptism. Think about it this way. In the Old Testament, a baby was circumcised on the eighth day because it was born physically into the family of Abraham. And in the New Testament, a believer is baptized after they're born again into the kingdom of God and into the church. You don't circumcise a baby before it's born and you don't baptize a Christian before they're born again. That's the way it's done. So these Baptists had their tongues cut out and their wives drowned in front of their eyes and they were persecuted because they dared do what they thought the Bible taught. And so they got a really strong conviction about what we call today religious freedom. And a lot of them got on the Mayflower and some other boats and they came over to the colonies and they said, we're, we're going to start over again where we can have real religious freedom, where the state doesn't tell people what to believe where we don't give money to the state to support the church. We gather together freely, and by faith we worship and support the work of Jesus. Now the Puritans came along too from England, and they wanted to start, they wanted to start over too, but the reason they were called Puritans is because they wanted to purify the church state. They wanted to do the whole church state thing again here in the colonies, but they thought we could do it right. And the Baptists said, no, it can't be done right. There's no way you can marry the church and the state. And nothing will come of that but corruption. 
We have to have a wall of separation between church and state, and Baptists were the group who insisted on religious freedom in the United States of America. They would not sleep. They wouldn't give up until as late as 1833, the last state in the Union, Massachusetts, passed a law and stopped forcing people to give money to the state church. Stop forcing people to think that they were told what to believe. We believe, Baptists, more than anybody else, in religious freedom. These are facts that we need to recapture because we came from a past church. In Europe, we left it behind. We left behind a past where the state forced people to believe a certain way and to go to a certain church and to, and to support a certain church financially. And we said, no, that's wrong. There should be a wall of separation between the church and the state. These two entities are both, uh, they're both ordained by God, but the state has nothing to do with what the church is doing. The church must be free and people must be free to receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior on their own, not because somebody decided it for them when they were born. Religious freedom. And now, ironically, we look around and we see another error popping up. The error back then was a relationship too close between the church and the state, where the state was used by the church and the church used by the state. Now we're going down a pathway where it's not the state and the church working together, but it's the state oppressing the church. Now we're losing our religious freedom. And many people who are sitting in pews in churches this morning don't understand the legacy, don't understand the heritage of religious freedom. Church, I hope that some of you knew the story that I just told. I suspect many of you didn't. We need to understand the importance of our beliefs and our practices. These are not just things that we picked up Harry Carey along the way. Things like baptism have meaning to them. And they make a difference in our culture, in our society. We should know why we do the things that we do. Now, our mission is not to go out and convince other people that we're right about baptism and they're wrong about baptism. That would, be, that would very easily become a distraction. Our mission is not baptism. Our mission is to see people saved by faith in Jesus Christ. Now, once they're saved, we'll tell them how to get baptized. But we've got to keep our focus on people being saved. Would you bow your heads with me? Have you been saved? Is the symbolic truths of baptism a truth in your life now. Have you been buried with Jesus in baptism? Have you been raised to walk in newness of life? Have you received His Spirit? Are you walking in the Spirit? Do you have the power of God in your life? Are you trusting in Jesus and Jesus alone to stand before God on Judgment Day? You know, the Bible says that we'll all stand before God on Judgment Day and we'll give an account in the flesh for all the things that we did here and God will judge us based on his standard of righteousness, which is the Ten Commandments. If you're not familiar with it, it's in Exodus 20. Read it this afternoon. What you're going to find, if you've never read the Ten Commandments before, is that we have all broken the Ten Commandments. And that we need God's forgiveness. We need his grace. We need his mercy. And the good news is that he has provided that grace and that mercy through Jesus Christ. Jesus died on the cross for our sins so that we can be saved. The Bible says that if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Have you done that? Can I ask you, you can answer the question just between you and God and your spirit, but here's the first question. Do you, you believe that God raised Jesus from the dead? Do you know that he died for your sins? Have you asked him to forgive your sins? And here's the key. Have you confessed with your mouth Jesus is Lord? Have you made that public profession Baptism in the New Testament was part of that public profession. We got, people got baptized to let folks know. I mean, you didn't even have to say a word. You didn't have to get up and give a speech, a testimony, or anything else. You just went down in the water and let somebody baptize you, and that was your speech right there. That was your testimony right there. You belong to Jesus. Now, maybe God is stirring in your heart right now, and you need to take care of this issue. We're going to have an invitation while we're singing. I ask you to come forward, and I or somebody will pray with you. And you take that first step of faith if you need to be baptized. Maybe you need to join the church. Whatever it is, whatever God is saying to you, would you say yes to him? 
Let us help you. Come down. Let's pray with you during this invitation. Father, we thank you for this symbol, this uh, so full of meaning of baptism. And we pray, God, that we could see more and more people baptized here at Grace in South Arkansas and around the world. Speak to our hearts right now, and I pray that we would listen and say yes to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand and sing.